I'm Kim Lai, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. The warmth of summer is gone, but don't let that chase you indoors. For some of our salmon anglers, the fall and winter months provide them with some of the best fishing opportunities of the year. We're fishing for silver salmon, what we call spoon fishing, which is a light flutter spoon. One of the techniques that we do is um, fish for these uh, fish that are coming to us, so we anchor up, wait for the fish to come to us, and in return in doing that, we target the fish that are coming right up out of the salt. So we fish tidal influence areas. I look for an area that has a really soft tail out into a narrow channel to the head of a, a riffle of a, of a river. And then what I'll do is I'll anchor up anywhere from two to three hundred yards, or sometimes even less, depends on the water uh, condition on how high it really is. These are the type of uh, flutter spoons that we use anywhere from FSGs to Manistees to your different types of lure, Jensen lures. Some are uh, factory painted, some are custom painted and whatnot, and so one side matches the other side of the lure. The way it works is um, we let it out behind the boat, sometimes 50, 75 feet, and it sits back there and flutters. And the wobbler action of the wobbler is if it's, if it's spinning around, then you're not fishing. But if it's back there fluttering from side to side, in other words, when it stands up on in, comes down and stands up and on in, then you're fishing really good. Uh, line angle is a very crucial key here with uh, wobbler fishing. If your line's straight out from your rod tip to the water, then you've got too much of a um, twist on your um, wobbler. If your line has a bend in it, in other words, a little bow to your line to the, to the water, then it gives it a little bit better action to your lure when it's uh, working in the current. Right now we are probably in four to five feet of water, and it all depends on um, how much water we have as to how big of a lure we use. So we adjust accordingly to, to, the, to the size. I think the fish view this lure more as an aggravation. They strike more out of uh, instinct, aggression. Uh, the gear that I use, I use a uh, nine foot medium action St. Croix rod and I use a, um, just a small bantam reel and I use a 15 pound uh, test and, uh, for mainline and 15 pound leader. I think it's very important to use a medium action rod due to the fact that you want to make sure that you give it to the fish otherwise too stiff a rod you'll take, take uh, the lure away from the fish. You need to let him take the line, let the rod go down until the line is coming out of the reel to where the fish turns down rivers, headed down rivers, then you grab the rod, pull it out, and set the hook so that you bury it in the corner of his mouth. So we have a number of late season coho opportunities in the state, uh, primarily in three different areas, uh, the Grays Harbor System, Willapa Bay, and the Lower Columbia. So places like the Chehalis and Willapa River, uh, the Locomen, Cowlitz, and one other place is up on the Skycomish up in Puget Sound. Um, all of those areas have late season coho potential and we see good catches of coho during the month of November in all of those streams. Here are some other fishing opportunities across Washington during the next few weeks. Before removing an old dam from a stream to improve fish passage, you need to first remove the fish. 
that's what our biologists did in Ponderay County as we get ready to remove Cedar Creek Dam. In preparation for removing the dam, we, there are some permit requirements which say that we need to remove all the fish out of the area above, above the dam where we'll be working. We have taken out mostly brook trout, rainbow trout, a few cutthroat trout, lots of uh, slimy sculpin, and we're doing three passes with our electroshockers with three different crews of three people. We will probably end up taking out about a thousand fish out of this section of stream. The native fish will be put back in the stream below the dam so they can't get back up into the project area. The non-native fish, we're going to take those down below Box Canyon Reservoir and let those go and they will not be able to, to migrate back up into the creek that way. This dam has, has blocked migration for bull trout and other native salmonids for over 50 years. Bull trout are listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. This area of the stream has been designated as critical habitat for bull trout. So once we have the dam out of here, bull trout should be able to use the entire watershed, which is um, about 12 additional miles of stream will be available to them. The city of Ione got involved in this project because I approached them in about 2001 and asked if they would be interested in removing their dam to improve fish passage. Um, shortly thereafter, the dam safety office came and did an inspection of the dam and found out that it was a safety hazard and at risk of, of failure and high flow because of abutment erosion around the ends of the abutments during high water. So the dam safety office actually issued orders to the town of Ione telling them that they needed to either remove the dam or repair it. They looked at their options and decided that removing the dam was the, le the least cost option and it also provides for fish passage. Today we have uh, several folks from the Department of Fish and Wildlife helping remove fish. We have a crew from the Kalispell Tribe of Indians, some folks from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Forest Service are all helping out today. And the support for this project has been incredible. We've had donations from the Washington Department of Transportation, from Boggin Brothers Lumber. The town is contributing a great deal. The western gray squirrel is on the state threatened species list. To help this small animal, we need to know more about it. A research project in southwest Washington is underway so that we might keep the western gray as a resident of our state. We're looking at trying to figure out, among other things, what might be uh, the cause of their decline and what we can do to help manage for the species to uh, at least stabilize, if not increase, their population in Washington state two sides of one canyon where we're trapping for western gray squirrels. We put out these live traps at 12 by 12 in 12 by 12 grids in which we've got 144 traps put out at 80 meters apart. We run through in the morning and set those traps, bait them with uh, English walnuts, and then come back about two, two and a half hours later and close traps and process whatever western grays we have in those traps. We'll be running the squirrels into a capture cone and then uh, radio tagging some individuals, taking collars off of others, uh, ear tagging, blood sample, uh, general condition of the animal, and finally weights of the animal. And then we'll turn them loose. We used to uh, anesthetize them, but uh, this capture cone has turned out to be a real godsend, as it were, because we don't have to put the animals down. We're going to be collaring juveniles so that we can look at dispersal of juveniles from the area. Check the ear tags on this animal. This animal's already been ear tagged. One in each ear. This is the radio collar itself. They weigh about 15 grams. Cut that excess off. Ordinarily, we take a blood sample. We've already blood sampled this animal previously. It's a female. We weigh the bag in the or the squirrel in the bag, and then subtract the bag weight. And that's all the processing necessary for this animal. So we will turn her loose and. They're fast, we release them out of the bag and they're out like a shot. 
We track these animals typically two to three times a week. We get locations on them. We find out whether they are in any particular species of tree, whether they're in a nest. Uh, over time, with enough locations, we get an idea of the home range of the animal, uh, how much, how many acres they're utilizing. We can find out where their nests are and how many nests they use. We, we tag each and every one of those nests that we find animals in. Uh, these animals have their place and some of the things they do we're just about, we're just learning about now. Uh, one of the things they do is they, we call it scatter hoarding. They uh, bury acorns to return to them later as food sources. Surely a large percentage of those acorns never get dug up again. They may in fact grow and become full-grown trees at some point. So for all we know, squirrels may be have an influence on oak survival and oak reproduction. Here are some opportunities to see Washington's wildlife during the coming weeks. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.